Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your certainly busy days. I know yours are probably as busy as mine, as, if not busier, to uh, attend one of uh, another one of our Siemens live seminars. Today we're going to get a chance to look at uh, four-axis programming on a mill, but we're going to concentrate on the G-code side of things. Um, certainly the intention here is to not only get you familiar with some of the G-codes that would be leveraged in this type of technology, but also how do we then align that to a CAD CAM system. I am going to be your host for over the next uh, hour or so, Chris Pollack. I am the manager of what we call our virtual TAC or Virtual Technical, Technical Application Center. Um, I develop a lot of content all around operation and programming topics as well as getting to some technical topics, uh, whether it be some light commissioning topics or service. I am here as a resource to anyone and everyone that has questions regarding the Siemens product and portfolio. Uh, certainly, I'm not an expert in everything. We got a lot of stuff, but uh, I can you know, help you navigate the waters from an operational programming perspective. And certainly, if I don't know the answer or need to refer you to somebody else, I can also help you get to the right context. So by all means, feel free to reach out to me. I am a resource here for you. Um, you can always try to call me or shoot me an email. Typically, email does tend to work the best because I do get around a little bit. Okay, so not to uh, not to plug what's coming up, but I always like to plug what's coming up anyway. Um, kind of a little uh, little incentive or teaser for you guys to see where we're going next. Um, in the shop turn side of the world, that's our conversational programming package. I did a series of seminars, kind of stepping a user up through uh, more complex topics and technology, right up to a multi-channel lathe with two turrets, live tooling, main spindle, sub spindle. Well, I'm going to parallel that series in G-code topics. So the next one you're going to see in March, we're going to get into working with a C-axis lathe, C and Y-axis lathe, that has a counter or a sub spindle. And we're going to drive all that through G-code and program guide. So transmit, trace, sill, a lot of the functions you're actually going to see today in the forex's mill, how does that apply to a lathe? And then we're going to do the second part of a, um, a webinar series I did on variable programming. We're going to do kind of the next step. We're going to get into a little more advanced topics of variable programming. So check that out. And certainly, if you guys haven't seen any of the previous webinars I was mentioning, you can always refer to our CNC for You website. All the material we develop is available here for uh, download or for viewing. Um, you know, post date. So we've created quite a library of um, seminars that are all recorded sitting there for you. So by all means, go back, check them out. You click on the webinar link, go to the technology, and there you'll find the previous recordings. Uh, additionally, I always send out the links as well after the events. So you guys will get that from today's webinar. Now, in conjunction with a lot of the stuff we're doing, you know, virtually in a, a web-based format, we also do a lot of in-person classes. So I always like to kind of let you guys know that we have actual in-person training. We host it in Chicago at our Elk Grove facility. It's just um, maybe about 10, 15 minutes from the O'Hare Airport. So it's in the suburbs of Chicago. And it's a great place if you want to get in and really dig into the details of our control. We have a whole series of operational programming classes. We have a bunch of technical classes, service. We're getting into some PLC commissioning topics. So check it out. All the classes and all the content that we develop here is completely complimentary. Um, we certainly appreciate you guys taking the time and the expense of coming out and spending time with us, whether it be on these sessions or physically um, traveling to one of these locations. So there is no charge. By all means, take advantage of it. There's a lot of material out there. OK, but today, without further ado, we're going to talk about topics that apply to two of our three controls in our current portfolio today. Um, now, a lot of the things we are going to talk about would apply to the 808. But as a whole, everything you see today would work in either of these two control platforms. So I just want to make sure you, know, you guys understand that. If you do find yourself you're working from the 808, some of this stuff's not going to be available, but a lot of it will be. Okay, So that's where you'll have to kind of 
filter it based on your technology. But everything you see today will apply to both of those two controls. And as I mentioned before, briefly, you know, the, the intention of this seminar is to kind of get your exposure to um, some of the functionality of a four-axis milling machine, but, and even probably more important, to understand enough of the code so you can determine whether or not your post is outputting the right stuff. Because that's usually the big challenge. You know, typically we find in this type of technology, people have a tendency to probably leverage CAD CAM systems more. Certainly the more advanced the machine gets, the more, more likely you're going to go to a CAM system. But the biggest question is always, is the output code that the system's sending, is it really going to be compatible and drive my machine the way it's being expected? So to learn the base fundamentals of programming these things longhand, it really kind of allows you to be able to determine if the post is doing what we need it to do. So that's going to be kind of the intention today, and we're going to look at a whole range of, of topics within this. So first, let's set up the expectation of the technology, right? What kind of machine are we talking about now? So we're talking about four-axis machines, typically found in either a vertical or a horizontal orientation, right? These would probably be the, the two most popular kinematic setups, I would say, in this market space. Now, today, our example is going to focus around a vertical machine with an A-axis rotary table. But everything we talk about would also apply if you found yourself on like a horizontal machine with a B-axis rotary. Now, when we, when we add this technology in, what is it, what changes as far as the screen's concerned? Well, as far as the control, we're just going to add an additional rotary axis. And certainly the determining of the letter of that rotary axis will follow the ISO standard. But generally speaking, everything is going to look the same. You know, we, we kind of use building blocks when we, we set up our controls and we commission our controls. We don't always want to, you know, have to create a whole brand new control series just for a specific technology. We'd rather be able to kind of churn on that functionality. So the cinematic control is very robust in that. You know, the same control you run on your simple three-axis mill can be driving your five-axis machine or, or way above that. So you'll see as you move between different technologies that we just kind of turn on some different functions. So in this case, you'll see a rotary come up. Uh, when we get to more complex machines, maybe I see two rotaries come up. Now, how does the whole thing kind of work? Well, we're going to follow what we call the right-hand rule. And that would be how the kinematics are set up on a given machine. And they call it the right-hand rule, because if you look at the image there in the lower center, if you were to take your hand and point it where your thumb, pointer finger, and then middle finger are all pointing in an XYZ direction, the direction they're pointing in is pointing positive. And from there, the rotaries that would, would rotate about each linear axis would follow the same standard. So an A axis should always revolve around X, a B axis should always revolve around Y, and a C axis would always resolve, revolve around Z. Now some builders may go in a different direction as far as this topic, but for the most part, if we can, we always try to encourage our REMs to follow this, you know, this ISO standard of how the machine is going to set up. So the primary machine we're talking about is a XYZ orientation where the Z is pointing up and the A axis is rotating about the X. And if you look at the direction of the A axis, a positive direction would kind of be rotating towards me, at least as far as the perspective of the tool is concerned. Additionally, had we been on that horizontal machine, I would still see a B-axis rotary pop up. Um, but you may, however, also see a fourth axis or a fifth axis, which would be like a W or a programmable quill. Those are real popular in those types of kinematics. So, I mean, really, that's more of a five-axis machine. But however, you have two linear axes that are really moving in the same direction, right? So if you look at the base fundamentals, it's still only a four-axis machine kinematic. So that's real popular. You'll see a lot of those out in the field. They, as well, will follow the standard right-hand rule. But now your hand kind of rotates around a bit, because you always want to have the z-axis pointing towards the machine spindle. And that's a real, that's a real pop, you know, important concept to always keep in the back of your head. And sometimes we overlook that fact. You know, we wonder why a horizontal lathe and a vertical lathe is oriented the way they are. Well, Z always points towards your main spindle. 
go into horizontal, you'll see the Z is pointing actually horizontally in what we'd be used to probably the normal orientation of a, a Y axis on a vertical machine. And then the rotaries are going to follow the same rule. You know, so the B is rotating about the Y. On this machine kinematic, the Y is standing straight up. But from a programming perspective, it's all going to program the same. OK. Once you kind of get your head around the machine kinematics, you know, what are the axes available on my machine? Kind of where are they if I start to jog it? How does the machine move spatially? Then I have to look at how is the rotary set up or commissioned? We like to use the term commission. That's really just a fancy word for how it was set up by the OEM. So there's a bunch of different ways you can start to set up rotaries. Here, I'm just pointing at two of these ways. But it's important when you start to drive your machine around, you know and have an expectation to how the machine's going to be moving. So you can see where we can have a, a limited axis travel. And that would be a case where the rotary axis can only go a set amount of degrees, and then it's going to have to stop for any given reason. You know, maybe it's a case that mechanically it can't rotate that far. Or maybe you have some kind of a uh, work holding where there's plumbing going through the center of the rotary, and it can only wind up so much. So that would be what we would consider limited axis travel machine. So that, that rotary may be allowed to revolve three, four, or five times or more. But at some point in time, it has to stop moving. And then once it stops moving, to go back to zero, it has to completely unwind or do like, a, like an unwind scenario that we see quite commonly. Years back, there was limitations in CNC controls. So really, all the CNC controls worked that way. And the reason why they kind of worked that way is really the, the controls were designed as linear controls. They didn't quite know how to treat a rotary. So they would just kind of let the rotary wind up. So even if there was no mechanical limitation, the control would still have to treat it that way. Well, we came out, or you know, the control manufacturers came out with a little different method of driving a rotary. And that's what we call a medullo axis. And that's a rotary axis that can continuously spin. And there's no mechanical restrictions to the axes. So if you happen to have a control and a machine mechanically that can do this, what you'll see is as you rotate the rotary, you know, you start at 0, you start moving towards 360. When it hits the 360, it's going to just immediately go back to 0 again. And this way, I can keep winding that rotary up as long as I want, and I never have to unwind it because I just always have to get back to the rollover point. So how do I know if I have one or the other? So what we're going to do here is I'm going to jump over to sinew train. We always like to use sinew train as a great tool for us to kind of show the mechanics of the machine and what's happening. And we can start to kind of see the behavior of this machine tool. So I always say this is step one. Whenever you're getting used to a more complex machine, just jog it around a little bit and get some, some prediction as to the way it's going to move. Now, what does the machine look like? Well, this machine was set up or commissioned with what we call our machine space model. So that allows me a three-dimensional model that we'll be able to look at later to, to show the motion of the machine. Here you can see that's my spindle or my head moving up or down. My x-axis, in this case, this has a movable table. But the y-axis is actually up top where the z is. So you see just the head moves when I do y. So that would be my x, y, z, my three linear axes. If I want to rotate my rotary, I can pick my fourth axis. And now we can start to spin and see our rotary starts to spin. And it's going to spin in a given direction. All right, so that's the kinematic we're dealing with today right now. Now let's go back to jog and start to look to see, is it a modulo axis? Is it not a modulo axis? You know, and, and what do I have to know about this setup of this machine once I start dealing with writing a program. So I'd say first thing, we want to find out if it's a modulo axis. So start to jog your rotary axes. Either direction doesn't matter. And watch as it gets to 360, right? So I'm at 324. I'll slow it down a little bit. We're going up. And they see, boop, went right back to 0. So as it rolls over the crossover, it goes back to 0. So this is what keeps me from winding up. You know, if you see those rotary axes that it's going to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, that would be set up as a, a limited travel distance rotary. So in this case, if I ever want to go back to zero, I can just go shortest path back to zero or you know, close as I want to get it here. I'm just jogging. And I wouldn't have to 
you know, deal with the fact that that rotary spun five times, right? So that's what we call a medullo axis. So that's step one. Now, the next thing is how did the OEM set up the rotary? So when I say by setup, is, is it always going to go shortest distance? Can I program positive or negative values, and how does it treat that? You know, that's important. There's a bunch of different ways to set these things up. So this machine, if I take a look at it, and I give it a position move, say I'm going to go to 45, you're going to notice that the machine physically moves to 45 degrees. Now, the next question would be, what if I told it to go to, let's say, 315 degrees? All right. Is it going to keep going in the same direction, or is the, the rotor being commissioned for shortest path? So just plug it in. Just try it. Here we're going to cycle start, and now you see I'm moving in a negative direction. This is certainly always easier to visualize when you're standing in front of the machine. But this is telling me right now this machine is commissioned for shortest path. So as I push code into it, whether I program it longhand or drive it through a CAD CAM system, this is an important step. I need to know this. And your post guys are going to ask you this question too. Is it shortest path or is it positioning truly an absolute, right? Then I might have to drive a directional command. The next thing I want to know is what would have happened if I gave it a negative 45? Does this setup currently support positive and negative values? So here I'm going to run back to zero. So we'll be sitting at 360 or zero, right? Same position. And then I'm going to give it a negative 45. And if the machine was set up to not allow negative motion, it would alarm out right now. If it is set up, which mine is, it would go to the negative position, which is again 315. So getting your head around how it's going to position is just going to make things a lot easier for you when you start to actually program and also interface with your post developer, or if you are the post developer, when you start to set up that post. Okay, so those are a few of the things that you always want to kind of keep in the back of your head as you're first getting into um, using one of these machines. Now, from an offset perspective, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You're going to get an additional rotary axis offset. So you'll see the A or the B is going to be right there with all the rest of your work coordinates. So as you're used to going to the work offset table and seeing your G54 or 55, once we set up the machine to have a rotary, you will now get the new axis available there. And now I can put any angular offset in to shift my zero. Right, So, you know, if I put a part in there and I need to clock or time it relative to a feature or clamping, I can offset it there. Additionally, you can go into the details of our offsets, and you can do what we call a coordinate rotation. Now, the coordinate rotation, that's that, that little, like, rectangle with the, uh, with the arrow that's got a rotation. And what that is, is here you're telling the system to rotate the coordinate system about a linear axis. For any of you that have seen or watched some more of my advanced sessions, you know that from a five axis, this is the preferred method to set things up. And four axis, it's not, it's not as beneficial, to be honest with you. So a lot of times we find ourselves just giving it a direct axis offset. But either way, could certainly be supported in this type of setup. Now, we are dealing with a more advanced machine tool. This isn't a basic three-axis mill, right? We can do a lot more with a fourth-axis machine. So the next thing that you want to think about when you start to utilize and work with this type of technology is how do I want to set up my tool offsets? And there's really two different standards in the industry today. There's what we refer to as negative tool offsets or positive tool offset or a positive method. I've heard other OEMs have different terminology for it, but it all wraps up around the same concept. So what is the concept? Well, in a negative offset scenario, you're physically establishing the distance for every single tool to some known datum location, whether it's the top of the part, whether it's a reference zero, maybe the center of my rotary A. It's very common on these machines. right? But all the tools are not kind of working independently of each other. And if anything moves or changes, I have to really modify all of the tools by the same amount or I run into problems. All right? So you can do that. You can apply an off, a work coordinate offset as a modifier. But from a management perspective, you're, we're managing a lot more data. There's also nothing that's independent when it comes to setting the tool. So you, you tend to have the same have to have the same process every time you set up a job, where I got to touch off all my tools again. 
In the other op option, what we call positive tool offsets, the tool offset itself is a positive distance. You can see that in the image on the left. And it's a distance from what we refer to as gauge line. That could be the face of the spindle. That could be tr the true angular gauge line with a, like a cat 40 tool. It's kind of up in the spindle a little bit, about an eighth of an inch up. And it's the distance from that reference to the tip of the tool. And whether you work from spindle face or true gauge line, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It, it affects you when you're going to work with an external presetter, um, or maybe if you have a rotary um, offset in the physical head. That's a little different scenario. But in this type of kinematic, you can establish everything from a, from a face of the spindle. That's OK. But now, when I need to find the center of my rotary or the top of my workpiece, you actually put that offset in as one offset, and that goes into the z-axis field of the work coordinate, like we see on the right. And now this would be where the large negative value comes in. So I can now have one offset set that sets where the top of my work holding is or the top of my part is, and the offsets themselves for the tools are completely independent, and they'll be the same value no matter what program you run. When you get to more complex technology, this becomes a much cleaner way to commission or set up your machine tool. So we always recommend kind of moving into this direction. And this is the primary concept. Um, I think we're going to do a live session actually in front of a machine tool with video cameras and everything real soon, probably within the next couple months, and show this topic live because it's an important concept. And a lot of guys that are coming from the three-axis world, this is a new method or way to set up a machine tool. I mean, I'll be honest, when I when I started, when I was you know, on working on lower technology machines, we always set up everything negative tool offsets. But when you start to see the benefits that come in, really where you want to get to is at some point the positive. OK. So we're working around one program example to show you the features and functions. It's just a very basic example. But it's going to allow us to look at a few different operations and applications, right? How do I handle milling, flat planal style milling on multiple faces of a part? And this is where I can get into driving the rotaries. Can I do tool path that is wrapped around a cylinder? That gets into what we call cylinder surface milling. How do I handle drilling? Drilling on planes, drilling about. Uh, a given radius, like our bolt hole pattern around the slot. How do I machine a basic slot? So we're going to kind of collectively work together and build a program based around making this job. And I'm going to then show it to you in three different ways. We'll, we'll write pieces. I'm going to write the whole thing here. We'll, I have a, another program that's set up we can use some of the operations from. But we'll write pieces of the program to do this as if I was running it completely on longhand. Then I'm going to show you what this exact program would have looked like being driven or coming straight from a CAD CAM system. And you can see the commonality, and you can see some of the functions that we've already been using from a straight G-code perspective. And then the last thing we're going to get into is a little more advanced feature, which we call our swivel cycle, uh, also referred to as dynamic fixture offset. So that'll be the last thing we look at uh, at the end of the session. But first and foremost, what we want to do is we want to create a part program. So as always, we're going to navigate to the Program Manager area, typically with our Program Manager button. Um, that can either be found as a hard key, or if you hit your Menu Select button, then you'll get the soft key equivalent. But either way, you're going to get to the area or the directory that has all of our part programs. Once we're in that area, then we're going to create a new program by selecting the new key. And we're going to choose a Program Guide or a G-Code program. We'll give it the name, and that'll launch us into our editor. Once we're in the editor, we're going to start to work with first building what we like to refer to as either our program header or our safety line. So I'm going to show you a few new tricks here we're going to get into. Um, we're going to use um, some, some higher level commands, like creating local variables. I'm going to show you how to use groups um, when you get into G-code, whether it's coming out of KCAM or locally. Groups are a nice way to be able to kind of um, categorize programs, make them a little more streamlined looking. So we're going to explore that. We're going to look at our workpiece. We're going to look at the super command, adding in rotary support, so all that good stuff. So the first thing when we start this program, once we've created it, is we're going to go and we're going to create a what we call a local variable. 
Um, and I went into a lot of this in detail in that uh, webinar I did based on variable programming. So I, I would suggest if you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's, uh, we go into this in a lot more depth here. But why I like to show this and why I like to use this is it's real common to use the super command um, to basically suppress or, you know, sh temporarily shut off our work hornet system so we can drive the machine to a location based, based on the machine coordinate system. It's very common to see this throughout your program, whether you drove it longhand or it's coming out of your CAD CAM system. The problem that tends to happen is if I'm either A, moving programs from machine to machine, or B, I just, I'm coming from a CAM system and the CAM system doesn't really know where the optimal you know, reference return point is on that given machine, you tend to find that you have to edit these values a lot. And you get a long program, you may be running through 10,000 lines of code finding all these different super statements and doing find and replaces. Well, if you use a variable and you set up the variable to the head of their program, and now every time the super command comes in, it just references a variable, you can make a change at one point at the very top of the program, and it will address every super throughout that program length. So it's really a, a much cleaner method, and I'm coaching a lot of the CAD CAM post developers I work with as a clean way to kind of handle the super command. Now we are going to add in the A-axis orientation, because now I do want to clock my A-axis to send her to a safe position. Once we've done that, we're going to create the groups command. Now, groups um, through the control is very easy. There's just a basic soft key we're going to use to build the group. And then I can start to put content with inside the group. But if I am creating a post processor and I want the post to automatically build groups, the syntax is going to look like this. So it's group underscore begin. And then inside parentheses, for a standard machine of this technology, you're always going to put the zero comma, and then in quotes, whatever you want that group name to be. Right? And you could theoretically use the same name multiple times. It doesn't, it doesn't have to even be unique to the part program. Follow that after your end quote by two more zeros. And then when you want the end of the group, so basically anything that sits between the group beginning and the group end statement, you can expand or compress right at the control, open and close. And you'll see that's where this gets It's really clean. So that's really all you need, those two statements inside the G code. Now we don't have to type any of that stuff if I'm doing it through program guide because there's a soft key button that handles that for us. Then we'll come in, we'll put in some of our coordinate locations, we're going to set up our, our standard safety line, right? Work coordinates, absolute or incremental, you know, what unit of measure am I in, that kind of stuff. And then we'll even add our blank. And here, you can see where we have a new function within the blank, because I'm dealing with a machine that has a rotary axis. So now I'm going to pick, how is my work holding held? Is it being held by the rotary? Or maybe the rotary is just to show, sit off to the side on this machine, and I'm doing everything off the table surface. Now it's important, if you have the clamping option, to define it. Because if you don't define it, if you leave it at table, then you're not going to see simulation supporting four axes. Now, if you don't have the clamping field at all in your machine, that means the OEM didn't commission it, then it should always support fourth axis machining. But if the clamping field's there, we want to certainly use it. Okay, so with that right here, why don't we transition over and we build the start of our program. Okay, so if I come back over to Sinew Train, we're going to, as I mentioned, use Program Manager to get in. I decide, as always, where I want to write my programs. Here I'm going to put it in my part program area. And we're going to select New and give it a name. So I'm going to call mine just Sample 1. Keep it nice and simple. Launches me into my editor, and now we're starting. So as, as a, a note to pay attention to, if you're going to start to use groups and you're going to start to use local variables, you always have to define the local variables or create them, right, because it doesn't exist. So we create them through what we call a def statement or definition statement. We always have to define the variables before we do any kind of real commands. But the only thing you can put before a def definition statement is just comments, including groups. So if you want to use groups, Put your depth statement first, create your local variables, and then start building your groups. 
So what can I do here in defining? Well, what I'm doing is I'm basically saying I want to build a variable internally in the system for the length of this program's running. And the real just tells me that that variable is going to be a real number, as opposed to maybe an integer, which is a whole number, so it would round up or round down. And then we have all kinds of different other variable types, um, uh, Boolean variables, um, uh, string variables, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. So here we're just going to do a simple real, and maybe I'm going to call it my xpos. And if you have a bunch of the same type of variables to create at the same time, you can do that right here and just put a comma between each one. So I always like to start my variables with an underscore. And the reason being is there's all kinds of system variables in the background of these controls running that you could collide in if you happen to use the same exact variable name. But what I will tell you is no variable in the Siemens library has ever started with an underscore. So if you always build your variables with an underscore, there's no chance of you colliding with one of our variables. So that would start the program or define or create these local variables. And then they could be used anywhere in place of a numerical value. And it's going to go to look at whatever number I set the variable. And we're going to do that next. But first, I want to build a group. So when I'm in my editor, you're going to see a ver vertical soft key called build group. And by doing this, right now it only asks me for some name. So I called mine the header. I say accept. And now I have, and I don't need that blank, I have this little area I can expand and contract. So anything that I put between those, that was that group begin and group end I showed you in the last slide. That's This is what it'll look like when you bring it to the editor. So I, I come in. I've now created a group. As long as I expand it out, anything I plug into here now would physically be inside these groups. So maybe I want to set my variables. So I underscore x pause and give it some number. And then I could do my y. And here I can kind of cheat, copy these. I like to cheat whenever I can, save myself some time. Right? So we're going to get rid of those. And this is just giving us a chance to set whatever value. And this would be the area you would then modify if you needed to, to change where the superposition went. So we'll go minus 1, and we'll go 0. OK. So then from there, and what I'm going to do just to save some time is I have um, already created this part program. So we can kind of steal some data out of it, save us some time. We were building our safety line and our header. So let's just grab some of this stuff. OK, I hope I don't need those variable definitions. I already created them. I just need this stuff. What's nice with the Open Further program, as you create little templates or common areas, you can copy and paste from one program to another pretty quick. And then I could close it, and voila, I just created a whole header statement. Now the work piece, that can be found under various and blank. That gets you to your workpiece. And then inside the workpiece, this is really where I set up what the clamping looks like. So remember I mentioned tabular A is a new field that we see. And then really what my blank looks like. So anybody that's done any basic G-code programming or control before has seen this already. So you build the blank. That lets simulation work. And this is really the first move that the machine has done. So I'm now telling it to wrap it to some location. I'm also canceling any active tool offset because we want to drive based on the machine coordinate system. And I'm moving to these values. So from here on out, whenever I plug in a super command, I'm probably going to use the syntax of these lines. And the group, see how I can expand or contract that? How look how nice that is? If I needed another one of these, I can be under edit. I can go copy, paste. Boom, I just built in two groups. I can cut it, get rid of it. So you can start to manipulate code really fast. And when you copy a group, it copies everything within that group. OK, so we're started. We got our header built up. We've positioned our A-axis to a safety spot. Now I'm going to come in and I'm going to create my tool change. So just like before, I'm going to use my group, and my group's going to contain my tool change. And here, this is just a case where you know I want to make sure I load a given proper tool, 
maybe I'm going to, because I don't necessarily know that I just came from the header, right? This could be a tool change event anywhere in the program. So I'm going to make sure I don't have any coolant running, the spindle's not running, send the Z to maybe a safe spot, somewhere close to tool change, and then we load our tool. And I'm using name tools for this job, but certainly we could use to use number tools as well. We can do either one. So it could be T and call T5, let's say, or the three-quarter inch end mill. And then you just set up your speeds and feeds. So if we add that to our program, and we can, uh, oops, let me go back, let me transition over. We add this to the program. Now we're going to add in our given tool change. So we'll go steal it out of our other job. And we're going to grab this tool change. And I can right click to copy and paste, quick way to, to put data in. So here we have a tool change. In my case, I'm just using a three quarter inch end mill and we're going to start to mill some features. Now, while I'm here, I might as well grab the next op that we're going to talk about in a second, because this is our first chance to see how we can drive a fourth axis around. And I'm going to throw an M30 in here because we're going to simulate next as well. So currently, my machine is sitting with a tool in its spindle, right? Spindle's running. She's at some safety location. But I haven't actually done anything. I haven't actually machined anything. So our first operation is going to be to mill a slot around the part. And what I did is I gave us a bunch of different ways or methods for me to mill a slot. So probably the most common and the most standard would be to drive the rotary to an absolute position. Now, remember, this one's set up shortest path. So generally speaking, I'm going to have to break up my moves at least into 180-degree quadrants. Typically, if this was like a CAD CAM post, I would break them up as 90s because I don't want to get to the chance where it might pick the wrong direction and I wasn't expecting. If you break up all your rotary moves to 90 degrees or less, then you're always insured on a shortest path configuration that's going to go to the right location. Additionally, we're going to look at the FB equals command. And this is important to look at because what a lot of people don't realize is when I move a rotary by itself, and there's no other linear axes moving with it, the system actually switches automatically to degrees per minute. It's no longer in inches per minute or feet per minute like I was before. Well, the difference between 100 inches per minute and 100 degrees per minute is, ex is, is very dramatic, let me say. So you're going to use what's called an FB equals or a non-modal feed command. So it keeps me from overriding the previous feed, which I think I set to 75 if memory serves me. Um, just for the length of that rotary move. So this is a nice way. Now you could just do an F equals 1000, but you got to remember to switch it back and you got to remember what the previous feed was programmed. The non-modal means it's only active for the length of this move. So we're going to look at that, but we're also going to take a look at, oh, it looks like I had, was ahead of myself in the slide. So here we're going to yep, talk about the non-modal, but we're also going to look at a couple different syntax methods. And you're going to start to see this, especially from posts you're going to see this DC command. And the DC is a, a nice way for a post writer to be able to create a post processor that's maybe a little more independent than all the different commissioning scenarios. So no matter how the OEM set up that axis, shortest path, not shortest path, allowing positive or negative directions, the post user can say, well, if I put a DC syntax on the command line, that's basically telling me that I'm going to directly drive that rotary the shortest path. And this, is, again, is where we also recommend starting to break up your moves in 90-degree segments. Now, if I'm interested in driving the move with a directional move as well, then you can use the ACP or ACN. So now in this case, I can do 180 degree segments because I'm actually do more than 180 degrees because I'm giving it a directional command. So the P in the ACP or the N in the ACN stands for positive or negative. So the only thing we got to make sure we know and we're in sync with is what direction is positive and what direction is negative because that's, again, fully up to the, the OEM to set up. So in our little example here, we're going to plug this in probably with a direct axis move. I do want to show you the behavior of the feed rate. Okay. So we have our slot. 
I really just come into position, feed down to a plane point on my part, and then I drive the machine. And in this case, we have it driving with the, uh, the DC command. I could certainly uncomment any of these. And then we're going to see this, this FB equals. So if I, I looked at the simulation, it's not going to be all that sophisticated. We're going to literally see an end mill come in and machine a slot. Let me slow down my simulation so you see it. So there we go. We fed in, dropped, and created a very simple slot. But if I look at the program, if I actually run the program, I want to show you that behavior. When I run it, uh, can it? Yep, there you go. So here we see, I have it throttled all the way back, but here you see the system automatically switched to degrees per minute. It had to, because how do I program in a linear feed rate, which is what inches per minute is, right? An inch is a linear measurement. How do I program a linear feed rate when I don't have a linear move with the rotary? Had there been a linear move, there are always going to be timed moves, and then the linear feed rate always takes precedence. Okay. So that's where the FB, we're programming 1,000 degrees a minute. If I wrote it to 100, it would go really fast. And now you see that behavior. But I wanted you guys aware of the different syntax types as well as how to move a rotary. And I would say probably the most common from a post-processor you're going to see is the DC command. And generally when I work with post-processor developers, this is usually what I coach them on, is to how to drive the machine using this DC command. Okay. So we're going to move on a little bit in our program. And now we're going to do some just flat pockets. But I'm going to use the flat pockets and drive to a new orientation. So what happens is I can clock the rotary to a new location with my A axis. And then the machine will just do its basic X, Y, Z toolpath, whether it be driven from a pocket cycle. Now in my case here, we're using a rectangular pocket but we're using the M call function. What that does is if you've ever done any drilling, it's a modal call. So basically it's saying, hey, once this is turned on, whatever coordinates have come next after the cycle, basically sitting between the M call and the final M call, they're modal commands. So this becomes basically the center point, which would normally be here right, in the cycle, that I'm going to actually machine this pocket at. And I can now add a rotary position in it. If we look at the physical pocket by, by its nature, I don't necessarily have a rotary field there. So if there's no rotary field there and I wanted to just do a one-off pocket, what I'd have to do is I'd actually have to pre-position the rotary, which is okay. You can certainly do that. Um, in my case, since I wanted to do two pockets and I wanted to keep from having to program the pocket cycle twice, I was able to use the M call. But you see how there's no A rotary here? So if I want to do this a one-shot deal, pre-position your rotary just by giving your A move or your B move, and then you can run a pocket. But if you do the pattern, then you can give it a couple coordinates. And now when we simulate it, we're going to see it's going to do a pocket at 0 degrees at A and then at plus 90. So we spin around. There's our first pocket. Happen to do two cuts, and there's your flip, your 90. Now, what you want to be careful with is that move right there. See that red move right there? So traditionally, retracts, you know, we might want to keep them nice and close to the surface. But we got to remember, this thing's about to spin, and, and my part happens to be square or rectangular. So I have to, te I tend to have to use higher retract values to keep from clipping this corner, right? Uh, let me zoom in a little bit so you guys can see it. So if I had too close a retract, so to show you real quick, this is important, right? Maybe I didn't retract. Now, the way this program is set up, how I'm working this dimensionally, if you look at where Z0 is, I'm using Z0 as the center of my part. So my work coordinate, like we were talking about earlier with positive tool offsets, would be the distance from machine 0 to the center of my rotary. And now all these surfaces I'm going to work on are actually in a plus direction. So if the top of my part's 2 inch, because i got a 4 inch square block that's 10 inches long, then I'm giving it an extra inch of retract. Well, what if I made this only a quarter of an inch up? Well, here is where we start to see we can clip those corners when we go. And I'll just speed up the gas. 
All right. So you see the clip? So it knocked out that point. That's all the behavior of the retract value. So just be aware of that when you're when you're dealing with this type of technology that you may need to put a little bit larger retract value than maybe you typically would have. Okay. So we got some pockets in, and here you can start to see how we can drive our position data just with a simple A move. So what if we go into something a little more complex? So the next thing we're going to look at, and we are going to jump back to the slide deck, but I might as well paste in my cycle, is what we call cylinder surface transformation, or tracil for short, which is the command. And what that allows me to do is that allows me to start to wrap things around a cylinder. Now, this function does require an option. So the licensed option would have to be activated on your control. So even though you have four axes, you may not necessarily have the option turned on. And there's some setup that an OEM would have to do to turn this functionality on. But had they gone through, set up all the functionality, turned it on, then I'll use this these commands, this trace cell, to set up my wrapping, and then the value inside the parentheses is going to be the wrapped diameter, right? Whatever, whatever the size I'm going to wrap. So my toolpath is actually programmed flat. So the pocket was totally flat, and it's now going to physically wrap it around that diameter. Now when I'm done using this function, I turn it off with a trayfoof command or transformation off, and then I'm done with, with the feature. Now, it's extremely important when you start to work with this wrapping function that if you think about what's happening, we're actually substituting any y-axis moves now for a-axis moves. So the y-axis will no longer be moving anymore. So you program things in an x-y format, and the nature of the wrap around an a-axis rotary, I would be transposing the y-axis inputs into a-axis angular positions. But it's dependent on where you left the y-axis when you started. So with that being said, oops, if you look right here, you see how I have a rapid move, specifically putting the y-axis to zero? Well, that's where this, this transformation of this wrap is going to come from. So if you didn't pay attention to where you left the y, you can get a skewed wrap. Now, sometimes you want to do that. There are certainly are cases where you want to make your, your wrapping off-center. But typically, you don't. So just uh, keep that in mind. You want to make sure you pre-stage the Y, to, probably to zero, because that would be the center of the rotary in this case. And then we can come in and we can machine a flat pocket. And what happens is the Y-axis values, in this case the width command, I would program as if that surface right here, this wrapped surface, was truly flat, right? Take that surface and wrap it out, make it a flat plane. So there's a little bit of math you got to do. You need to know how long that, that arc length would be once it gets wrapped. So if you use the basically the diameter wrapping around times pi and then times the angle that you need. So in this case, I want it to go 180 degrees. So I could use the diameter I was at. I think this one's actually like 3.9 if memory serves me times 3.14159 times 180 degrees divided by 360. If I do this formula, that's what gave me 6.2830. And that would be the y linear distance of a pocket wrapped around that diameter at 180 degrees. OK. Sounds a little complicated, but it's not so much. You just got to remember that formula. So you look at the program here. You see I pre-staged my rotary. So I set zero. I, I want to certainly get A to zero here. I pre-stage my Y. I turn on my trace sill command, and I give it the diameter I'm wrapping about. Generally speaking, it's usually the major diameter you're working in. And if you think about the major diameter, I got a four-inch cube. So hence, that's really the diameter I'm working within. And then I come in, and I just program this flat pocket, giving me a length and width, and the width or the y-oriented values, I then have to do that math on just to figure out what the true distance would be based on, in my case, 180 degree wrap. So if we simulate it, now we'll see we can start to get some pretty sophisticated toolpath going without having to calculate all of those 
those positions and program all those, those um, angular moves or those rotary moves. When you get to CAD CAM systems, I've seen it both ways. Um, certainly, I think probably the most common, you wouldn't see a trace hill command instated. You would actually just see that the program would come out with A's and, and you know, A, A moves and X moves back and forth, creating that toolpath, that wrapped toolpath. Uh, but I have seen posts use trace hill as well. So um, that's really kind of up to the post developer if he's going to support it. I would say more commonly, I use this type of command structure when I'm longhand programming at the control. Okay, so we're going to now do a quick tool change, and quick because I can copy and paste, look at that. And the next thing we're gonna do is actually drill some holes. So if we look at our slides real fast, we're just gonna change to our 516 drill or whatever holes we wanted to drill. So this isn't anything unique, right? But now we're going to do some drilling. And the first thing I want to do is drill that bolt hole pattern that's inside that slot, the three quarter inch slot we machined earlier. So at the control, if it's set up properly, you can actually have the ability of telling it in our position commands that we're actually rotating about a rotary axis. So I can do a bolt hole pattern, but I can do a bolt hole pattern transposed around a rotary axis. Um, now, this is a new function, a new, relatively new function for us. Uh, we've had it in shop turn for years, um, but originally in the G-code side, you didn't have this ability. And we added it, I want to say, in version 4.7. So 4.7's been out for well, probably about three years now. So it's been available for quite some time, I guess. But uh, if turned on properly, and it certainly uh, would require just a basic setup at the control, you'll see that you have this extra area where you can toggle between the X, Y, and the X, A. And that's what allows us to then do a basic position move. Now, additionally, if I didn't want to use the, the positions command, which is the holes uh, cycle that you see there underneath the M call, then I could have just given it a whole bunch of angular moves, and I would have just had to figure out you know, how many holes, so 360 divided by 8, and that would have been my indexing angle. And I would have had to have positions with all those A moves. We're going to use the cycle because we have it and we wanted to show it to you. So you'll see in setting up the drilling, this is just a standard drilling cycle. Really, the only thing unique I'm doing here is I'm paying attention to my retract point because I know the rotary is spinning around. Now, since I'm inside a groove, I could actually keep things a lot tighter in this case. And we're thinking about where we're starting from. So remember, in my case, Z0 is the center of my part. So this, the, the, the radius I'm actually um, drilling on is actually 1.9 inches up. So that's where I have a 1.9 inch starting point. Um, a lot of times when I get to this type of machine, I have a tendency to position my, my depth as incremental instead of having to you know do the math and figure out what the radial value up would be. That's kind of six of one, half dozen of the other. But really the bigger thing is just keep attention, you know, pay attention to where your zero is. Uh, and generally speaking, it's usually in the center of the rotary. Okay, so we set up a drill cycle, and then we go into the holes. And again, all these cycles are just going to be through our standard cycle pull-down. So if you've done any basic G-code programming with us, you're familiar with how to get into the cycles. Okay, in my case, I wanted to go to a bolt hole pattern. But when I go into the bolt hole pattern, if it's set up properly, I can now toggle between an XY bolt hole or wrapping a bolt hole pattern around the A-axis. And that's what we did here. We give it the location where it exists in the x-axis. So in this case, it, I held the center of the part in x as 0. So basically, I have 5 inches negative, 5 inches positive in my, my stock or my blank. So I moved it 3 and 3 quarter inches over, and that's where we're going to drill some holes. And if I'm done, in this case, I'm done pretty quickly. I just give it my M call to stop my drilling. And that's what's going to allow us to start to transpose or drill these holes wrapped around the diameter. Okay, so we get our cylinder surface. Now I'm going to spin it around a little bit. Now when you're doing simulation here, we're not going to spin the part. It's easier for us to just handle moving the tool around a static object. 
But when we get to the machine space simulation, I'm going to show you a little bit, then you're going to really get to see what the true machine motion is going to look like. Then you'll see the part spinning. But always inside of the standard um, editor or, you know, editor simulation and process simulation is how we call it, you're going to see the tool move around the part. It's just, it's always going to look that way. Okay, so there's your bolt hole pattern moving into each of its positions, drilling our holes. So we're almost done. We got a couple holes to drill on these surfaces. So now we got a little different challenge, right? Now I'm going to do a couple holes on the same plane and then rotate and do a couple more holes on the next plane. So I come in. We're going to go compress. See how nice it is with the groups to be able to compress and expand and copy and move. Okay. So I'm now going to put a half inch drill only because that's the holes that, that this job needs, right? And we're going to use our drilling cycle to drill a couple locations. So in the cycle, you know, certainly we load up our drill. Here we can copy and paste it down. But in the cycle now, I have to decide, okay, how do I want to move around? So I could use our flat positioning holes, but I'd still have to, to move the rotary axis at some point. Or I can just give it G-code lines, right? So any positions that sit between my M call, and my first M call and my second, the M call on the cycle and the second M call, those are going to be the locations that drills the hole. So you can add the rotary axes in the positioning values. So here we're going to um, basically move to the three-quarter by three-quarter coordinate. That's all driven from our part print. And give it my first plane, my A0. Now, the next Y move down, well, I'm not moving the A, so don't give it, and the A won't move. The, the third position, now I want to flip 90 degrees. So it, certainly it's going to be back at its retract point. Be careful with that retract value when it spins 90 degrees. And then the final position, again, I'm staying on that flat plane, so I just give it the Y move. And then we can turn our um, drilling off with our M call. So that's what we have here. Here's our, again, our drilling. Now, in this case, you see I'm starting from 1.75, because had I looked back at the pocket cycle, that pocket, remember, was machined a quarter inch into the part, hence why our new plane is down an inch and, a quarter, an inch and three quarter. And I'm going to drill one inch deep from there. And when I'm done, I'm going to retract back out to the three inch between each move. So it may result, while I'm on plane, of a little bit larger retract values than maybe would be desired. Um, it's going to help me to keep from having to build two different drilling cycles to move from the one area to the next. So we come around, we machine our cylinder, we spot our first holes, and here you're going to see one, two, three, four. And there's that one rotary move. So, so yeah, like the retract here between the first two yeah, may be a little greater than I normally would want, but it keeps me from, again, having to stop the drilling, positioning up to a higher location, sending the rotary to spin around, and then turn drilling back on again. I can just keep, keep it pretty clean. So here you can imagine, you know, if we were running holes all the way around our part, let's say, it's just a quick, nice, easy way to handle um, X, Y, and A drilling. Now, if you go into the drilling cycle and the position screen and you go to the random, you can actually add an A-axis field here. So I could have actually handled all that within this position screen, but I just wanted to show you really what would it would more commonly look like from a CAD CAM system. Um, typically, I don't have CAD CAM systems using our positioning cycles. They're just going to output coordinates, and this is the way it's going to look. Okay, so there's just a couple last things that we're going to add to our program. All right, so some little niceties. So what I'm going to do is we're going to actually engrave a little engraving. Um, but what's nice here is I'm going to show you how to use the engraving cycle with an engraving tool, surprise, surprise, wrapped around a cylinder. So the trace cell command we used earlier can also be used for things like serial numberization, any type of engraving feature, and you can now wrap. So where 
Um, you might be used to taking the engraving cycle on a flat plane and making it like wrap around a, a regular arc. Now we can wrap around a cylinder by using the trace fill command. So that'll result in this engraved toolpath that's normal to this curved surface. So the bigger I keep making this engraving, it's just going to follow around this given radius. OK, so how do I do it? Well, just like I did before. Use your trace fill command, set the radius you're wrapping about, go into your cycle. The cycle is going to be programmed if it's two-dimensional. Two now here, the zero point is going to control where the center of the engraved text is around the 360. So, you know, if I wanted to move this engraving, so instead of being on the top, it's happening at 90 degrees, this is where I'd have to use that formula like we talked about before, figure out the arc length. I can't give it 90 here. That would be 90 linear inches because it's still a y-axis. Um, but then the system obviously will, will figure out and calculate all that for me. Now, what I'm doing is I'm wrapping it or, or tipping it around 90 degrees. So what we're doing is different than choosing this arc, because that arc would be on a flat plane, right? So it's just wrapping around like a hole or whatever. You know, same thing with this one, right? I'm wrapping around an arc. Here, in this case, I could actually use this and still wrap it around the cylinder. So you can get pretty crazy. But let's take a look at it. Let's see what it's going to look like. Now, I've also ended my end, end of program. We'll go in and take a peek at that in one second. But let's go see kind of what this toolpath is going to look like. I'm going to speed her up, slow her down. There we go. Save a little time. All right. So we drill our couple holes. And now you're going to see the engraving. You see how it's, it's working around the radius? Pretty cool, isn't it? So I can keep increasing the size, and it's just going to keep working around that radius. Now, like I mentioned, what if I don't want the cinematic right on the top of the part. Maybe it needs to be over around a little more down on this area. That's where you would use the y-axis inside the cycle to move the whole geometry. So I, I'm not going to do the math right now. I'm just going to guess. So I'm going to say I'm going to shift it an inch and a half. So that would be linear. And then it's going to then wrap that around a 3.8 inch uh, diameter. It's that right here. So if I look at it, we'll see that the engraving length stays a constant, but now she's going to move around the radius. You see how it just positioned it further around the radius so I can spin. So if I needed to know what the angle of this new occurrence of cinematic would be, that's where I'd again need that formula. OK. So that's. In a nutshell, I know we covered a lot, but you know, I wanted to give you guys a, a good overview of some of the features and functions you can start using here. This is how it would kind of look if I was just longhand programming the job. So next thing we're going to take a look at is we're going to take a look at, well, what would it look like from a CAD CAM perspective? Because let's face it, a lot of us in this type of technology are going to drive things. Oh, I got ahead of myself. So the final thing I added was my end of program. So here's a case where you can see the super, super line come back into play. And it's just going to read those local variables that we set at the very beginning of the program. But in this case, I am going to hard code one value because I want to center my table for part loading or unloading. Right? I don't want to just set it back to a safety location. So you can use an intermix. You don't have to, once you set up those, those local variables, use them for every single statement. You can kind of pick and choose. The other thing I did here is I used the tool zero command to clear my spindle. All right. All right, so now I'm not leaving a tool in the spindle at the end of the part program. Really depends on you and the job. Um, I'm always a big advocate of taking the tool out when I'm done. But if I'm in high production, then no, I would not. Why waste an extra tool change? Especially if the last tool I used is the same as the first tool I'm going to use. That's a different scenario. OK, but more importantly, what does the toolpath look like? And then what is it going to look like from the uh, CAD CAM perspective. So what we can do is we can run this program that we just created using our machine space model. And the machine space model allows me, so I'm going to go over to run, I'm going to rewind it, allows me to bring up our collision avoidance model. And now I can get a pretty good detail of what the toolpath would really look like. So let's just take a final look at that so you can get 
an understanding. So here you see no longer am I spinning around the part, but here would be where I'd physically have the rotary spinning. In this case, my table's moving back and forth. Of course, I already showed you how that works. We're at A0. Now we're doing our wrapping. All right, so again, I programmed an X and Y toolpath, but it calculated out the rotaries. And there's our rotary moves doing our final engraving. So this would be exactly how you would see it on the machine tool. This is exactly how the motion would start to look as you moved around the part. OK. Now, what about the CAD CAM? Before the CAD CAM, there's one last thing I want to show you, and that's from a simulation perspective. Now, I did not have to do this on my machine because I have the collision avoidance with the machine space model set up. So that graphic that you just saw, right, this graphic, this keeps me from having to do this extra step. But if you find yourself on a machine that is a 4X machine with standard simulation, you do need to tell us where the center of the rotary exists in the machine's travel. It's very important. So what happens is you're going to come in and you're going to use these 53220 parameters to establish the center line of the rotary. So you would change your axis display in your machine data to read the rotary axis. And then you'd come down and you plug in. So in this case, we're saying that um, in uh, first field is x. x I don't care about on an a-axis rotary. But I need to know the y location. Oops, sorry the Y location and the Z location for the center of the rotary. So here we're saying it's 10 inches, 10 inches. On my machine, it's actually um, 200 millimeters in the Y and neg or negative, and negative, I think, 300 millimeters in the Z. Um, it just happens to be metric because the machine was commissioned in metric, although we're running an inch. I don't remember what the, the equivalent values are. So if you have a machine, you go to run simulation, and the graphics start to show you or look like the image on the right, where everything's kind of running into this weird space in the center of the blank, doesn't appear to be in the center of the rotary, it's probably because these machine parameters weren't set up properly. So that's step one. If that's all good, reach out to me. There could be a couple other things you're, you're doing wrong, but, but usually it's just a case where um, the OEM overlooked the fact that you had to set up this. A lot of OEMs, they don't. They're not using the controls, so they don't try to go in and run simulation, whatnot. OK. So same part, posted from a CAD CAM system. So here, you're going to start to see the functions very similar to what we did before. So there's my definition statement on line 100. So again, it can be after comments, but it's got to be before any other commands. Then we're setting those variables, so that could all be done in one line. Or you can do it in multiple lines. It's up to you. I did it in multiple. Now, there's a new command we're going to talk about, which is feed group. And this is real important. Um, but other than that, you see like the group begin, the group end. That's really how the syntax would look to be able to expand and contract this program. So had I took a quick peek at what the program looks like, here is the CAD CAM one. So if we simulate real fast, just to prove to you, I'm not trying to, you know, put anything over your head here. This would be, right, this would be the toolpath. So this is just coming right out of a CAM CAM system. Now in their case, they didn't use trace still here. So if I look at this toolpath, I would see um, X motion for any move over and then A motion for the wrapping. But everything else, we can kind of dissect it a little bit. But what's nice here with the group is take a look. So I start scrolling down, and now I can look at a pretty lengthy program, and it's pretty short. So what I had is I had them add groups between tool changes. Now, with this, I have a bunch of operations for this one tool change. So op1, and there you see there's your, your DC command and your non-modal feeds. It works really well from a CAD CAM. So I had a program feed of 100 inches per minute. Now here we happen to flip it back, but you wouldn't have needed to because these are all non-modal feeds. And then I come down and I stay with an op1. If I wanted to get to op2, let's say. Oh, where is it? Oh, it might be uh, text. That's weird. 
Oh, because I'm below it. <laughs> I already came down far enough. So there's my op two. So these are, I have multiple operations within the same group, all because I, we just made it for tool change. Maybe you want to make your groups automatically come out with your operations. That's fine too. Uh, that's really up to the post, the post writer, right? So what's new here? Well, this command right here, your feed group and your feed group reference. So this is important to understand this concept, and we're going to switch back because I do have a slide built on this. When you get to rotaries, it has to do with how we calculate out feed rate. So by default, the, the system doesn't necessarily take the rotary axes into account when calculating feed rate. Um, and that really has to do more with higher uh, technology 5-axis machines. But when you get to driving toolpath like we are, where the rotary as a direct result in the position of the tool in relation to the part, right? Where we're spinning the part with our rotary and our tool is being propelled forward, I want to make sure that my rotaries are part of my feed calculation. So if you're not sure, and you probably aren't going to be sure, I would by all means suggest you just automatically create a feed group the beginning of your program, whenever you're going to be machining with the rotary, and it's going to look like this. So it's just a statement F group, and inside parentheses, it's the machine axis names. So if you put in XYZA and the system gives you an alarm, some OEMs use some interesting naming terminology. So check to see in the machine parameters under 20,080, check to see what the naming terminology is used, because this group statement has to match that naming terminology. But by just enabling this, now any of your feed moves are going to take the rotary axes into account. Now the next thing is we potentially need to know how far out on the rotary we are to calculate the right feed path. Right? If you think about it, if I'm doing a move and I'm moving 180 degrees, well the linear distance that I'm actually overcoming at a one inch radius, let's say, is a lot smaller than if I still did the same 180 degree move out at a two inch radius or a three inch radius, right? And that's the distance I am away from the center of the rotary. So when I talk about radius, I'm saying, you know, where is that cutter away from the center of the radius? You know, if I'm machining out at a two inch radius on the part, I want to tell the system that's where I'm at because that's how it'll calculate the correct feed rate. So that's where this fgref command comes in. Generally speaking, if I'm just doing longhand stuff, I'm not as worried about this. Um, but if I'm developing a post processor and I know I'm going to be doing a lot of rotary machining, then I want to make sure that I add in this, this fgref reference. So certainly if this is something that you, may, you guys would like to learn more about, I could spend two hours talking on this topic. Um, in our five actual class, I probably do spend about that amount of time talking about it. I know it's a lot to kind of grasp. I wanted to just get you exposed to the commands um, and just make you aware that without them, your feed rate could be being miscalculated when you're talking about your rotary in conjunction with your feed. So reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk to you more about this. Okay. So... The last thing I wanted to show you, and we're running late on time, and I want to open up to some questions because I'm sure you guys have a ton, is a, an extra function that is not an option-based command, uh, standard in any control, um, but it would have to be turned on by the OEM, and that's what we call cycle 800 or our swivel cycle. Um, a lot of people in the industry also refer to that as dynamic fixture offsets. But what it really allows us to do is now we can position a zero anywhere we want on the part, and the system will track and compensate for where I'm at based on knowing the center of my rotary and where my part sits on my rotaries. So for something like a four-axis machine, it's really handy if I'm, one, maybe working on a fixture and going out to different work holdings on the outside of a fixture, kind of like that earlier image we saw, um, or if I just have a lot of common tool paths that are maybe set from a zero plane on the outside of my part, and I don't want to have to redo those tool paths. 
I want to be able to move my zero around the part and also drive my rotaries, I can use the cycle 800 function. So I do have that last example using cycle 800. This would be kind of how the screen would look. Um, if you're interested in this topic in more detail, I would suggest taking a look. I did a 3 plus 2 webinar, and we go through this in a lot of detail, because this is really how you drive a 5-axis machine, but can absolutely be used with a 4-axis machine, uh, and it's really actually quite handy when you, when you get into working with it. So this would be what the cycle kind of looks like. The cycle itself lets us position our zero around, shifting it, lets us drive our coordinate system around. So normally on a 4-axis machine, I'm probably only going to give a uh, value in my X field or use a direct axis and give a value in my A. Um, and then from there, I might want to spin my coordinates about my Z to get my X and my Y pointing in a defined known direction. And then you can even shift your zero around once you've done the rotation. So for us, I did the same part, our final part here. And now I'm going to machine the exact same part, but I'm going to use the swivel cycle. Now, a swivel cycle really does two things for me. Um, not only does it allow me to control where my zero R is and driving of my rotaries, but I can also use it for a safety retract location. Because one of the things within the swivel cycle itself is the ability of telling it to go to a good known retract. We're not leaving it up to the part programmer or the CAD-CAM system to determine where a safe retract is. The actual OEM, when he set up the cycle, predetermined where this retract location is. So from a safety retract position, you'll see I use it a lot here. So not only at the very beginning of my program to send her up to safe spot, you notice I didn't have to worry about the SUPA command, but even at the end or maybe between tool changes, I'll use it in place of SUPA to get me to a, a safe location. What's nice with this is I don't have to cancel my tool offsets like we normally would with the SUPA statement. But what it also lets me do in features like the pocket, what if, oops, what if I wanted the pocket to work from Z0, not the positive two inches off the center of the part? Maybe this was a much more complex tool path that I'm calling from a sub. Well, the cycle allows me to manipulate my zero location. So here I'm shifting my zero up. That's how I'm staging the zero two inches in space. Um, later, I'm also going to let my rotary axis position move by doing either a rotation about a linear axis or maybe telling it a positive 90. Either way would certainly work. So I can drive the move too. So now instead of having to add all those rotary moves in, you know, the position in the A, I can do it right from the swivel cycle. So now when I do this next pocket, again, it's just X, Y, Z, zero, or maybe it's some super elaborate toolpath I'm calling up as a sub, and I let the cycle 800 stage my zero, rotate my coordinate system, all dynamically, it's tracking all that. So that is what I have. I know we covered a ton in a short period of time, as we always like to do. Um, but I do want to open up to questions from the audience, um, in case there's anything maybe I touched upon that you'd like a little more detail on, um, or even if you have a question on a non, you know, on an un unrelated topic, I'd be happy to talk about it. So with that being said, there's a Q&A panel or a chat window. Grab either one. I got them both in front of me. Type out your question. I'm going to start reading them because there are some typed in right now. Um, Mark asked if the session is going to be available for download. Uh, yes, it absolutely will. So at the end of the session, I try to get them out either today or, or on Monday. When I send out the thank you for attending, there will be a link in there. You can, uh, you can download or view the, the session, the recording. Additionally, it takes a little bit of time to get it up there, usually maybe a month or couple weeks at least, but now next it'll be up on Scenes Here For You. Remember I showed you that link earlier. Uh, if you want, I can put it back up again. We'll just zip up to that slide, non-formal. Right? Um, so if you go to this directly to my Scenes Here For You website, you can also, we'll, you'll be able to download it there, as well as some of the other um, webinars I mentioned before. Um, 
Can you define variables anywhere in the program? Good question, Dan. So the def statement, no. Always has to be at the beginning of the program. It has to be before any kind of moves, even that group command. Remember, I, I mentioned that earlier. Um, so if you need to create variables, you got to build them first. Now you can re you can change them, right? I can set them anywhere I want, and I just want to make sure I set it before I use it. So looking back at our little program here, uh, let's go back to the first one we were in. What I mean by defining, that's this line. So this is the line that Dan was asking about. So even if I had moved this, right, let's say I took that, cut it, and pasted it inside the header. If I was to go to simulate or run the program, you'll see it's going to yell at me. It says illegal def or proc instruction in the part program. And me having dealt with this for quite some time, I know immediately, oh, if I put my def statement somewhere after some other command. So whether it was something as simple as just doing my G17, G54, my safety line, any of that always has to be below the def. Okay, so hopefully that helps. Um, what else do we have here? It's always fun trying to kind of scroll down through. Um, okay, uh, here's a good question. So is the process of programming going to be the same on my horizontal mill? Um, and, and yes, everything I kind of showed you guys today would work on a vertical orientation or in that horizontal orientation like I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, really, the key there is instead of having an A rotary, I'd have a B rotary. Um, and the machine happens to be flipped on end, but that, that doesn't matter. You can, you can have it oriented anywhere you want. All right, let me see. There's a lot of thank yous and <laughs> all that good stuff. I just don't want to make sure I don't miss anything. I probably am, but uh, I know we ran pretty long. So with that being said, I want to thank you guys for attending as always. I really enjoy doing these, and certainly from the feedback I seem to get from the, the market, it seems like you guys enjoy them too. So keep on coming back. I'll keep on creating material, and also take a look and keep your eyes out for some of the new stuff we're going to be doing. This year, we think we're going to be doing some, some fun new stuff, exploring some new mediums. So with that being said, I am going to stop our recording. And again, thanks, everybody.